Hymn number 60. I'll praise my maker while I've breath, and when my voice is lost in death, praise shall employ my nobler powers. Will you please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1? It's page 170 in the Good News Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 1. In this book are the words that Moses spoke to the people of Israel when they were in the wilderness east of the river Jordan. They were in the Jordan Valley near Suf, between the town of Paran on one side and the towns of Tophel, Laban, Hadzeroth, and Dezahab on the other. It takes 11 days to travel from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea by way of the hill country of Edom. On the first day of the 11th month of the 40th year after they had left Egypt, Moses told the people everything the Lord had commanded him to tell them. 
This was after the Lord had defeated the king Sihon of the Amorites, who ruled in the town of Heshbon, and king Og of Bashan, who ruled in the towns of Ashtoreth and Edre. It was while the people were east of the Jordan in the territory of Moab that Moses began to explain God's laws and teachings. He said, when we were at Mount Sinai, the Lord our God said to us, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and move on. Go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all the surrounding regions, to the Jordan Valley, to the hill country and the lowlands, to the southern region and to the Mediterranean coast. Go to the land of Canaan and on beyond the Lebanon mountains as far as the great river Euphrates. All of this land, which I, the Lord, promised to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants, go and occupy it. Moses said to the people, while we were still at Mount Sinai, I told you, the responsibility for leading you is too much for me. I can't do it alone. The Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. May the Lord, the God of your ancestors, make you increase a thousand times more and make you prosperous as he promised. But how can I alone bear the, heavenly, the heavy responsibility for settling your disputes? Choose some wise, understanding, and experienced men from each tribe, and I will put them in charge of you. And you agreed that that was a good thing to do. So I took the wise and experienced leaders you chose from your tribes, and I placed them in charge of you. Some were responsible for a thousand people, some for a hundred, some for fifty, and some for ten. I also appointed other officials throughout the tribes. At that time I instructed them, listen to the disputes that come up among your people. Judge every dispute fairly, whether it concerns only your own people or involves foreigners who live among you. Show no partiality in your decisions. Judge everyone on the same basis, no matter who he is. Do not be afraid of anyone, for the decisions you make come from God. If any case is too hard, too difficult for you, bring it to me, and I will decide it. At the same time, I gave you instructions for everything else you were to do. We did what the Lord our God commanded us. Let's pray. Father, you've come into your house this morning. We know you're here and that you want to speak to us. And I don't know exactly what you want to say, but you do. Here's my mouth and here are our ears. We offer our hearts, our minds, and our wills now that you may penetrate all three with the truth that will set us free. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Amen. For the encouragement of one member of this congregation, and I hope is here, he wrote to me a year ago and he said, David, when are you going to take us through the book of Deuteronomy? And I said, well, I have thought about it, and maybe I ought to be thinking more about it, but not yet. 
about six weeks or maybe two months ago, he sent my letter back to me and he said, the time has come. And I want you to know that for your encouragement that I'm ready to listen to any of you if God speaks to me through you. And when I began to look into this book of Deuteronomy, the Lord told me very clearly, this is right where you are. And this is the book you will need to get hold of before you can take a single step further. The book of Deuteronomy was written precisely for the situation in which we stand now on September the 4th, 1977. It's a book that need never have been written. It's a book that shouldn't have been written. If the people of God had obeyed God when he spoke to them first, we'd never have had the book of Deuteronomy in the Bible. And I think of Len Moore's autobiography, the general secretary until recently of the worldwide evangelization crusade, and we have Philip and Nancy, I see, from Wex sitting up there. And the title of his autobiography came from a phrase used by, I think, a sergeant in the army when he had been a private. And the title is, when I say move, move. <laughs> and that's the theme of what I have to share with you this morning. When I say move, move. But the I there is not JDP, it's God. And the most amazing thing to me is this, that a journey that should have taken them less than a fortnight took them 40 years. It is only 11 days, says Deuteronomy, from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, which was the very edge of the promised land. In less than a fortnight, they could have been right in the middle of God's promise. They could have been drinking milk and eating honey in less than a fortnight. But on the 11th month of the 40th year, Moses said to them. Isn't that incredible? Why so incredible? I'll tell you why. Because God stayed with them even though they were a hundred miles off course and 40 years overdue. Isn't that incredible? God could have washed his hands of them or as I heard Ann, Be Ann Baxter say, he could have taken them back to Egypt and drowned them in the Nile. But even though they missed what God had for them and even though they were a hundred miles off course and 40, mile, 40 years overdue, God stayed with them. And so did Moses. So God stayed all that time and he gave them a second bite at the cherry. And he said, you can go in now. But before you go in, I want you to be absolutely clear the conditions on which you may enter, possess, and keep what I've got for you as a people. Those conditions cover almost every aspect of your life. What you eat, how you treat immigrants, your sexual relationships, your home life, your attitude to work, to money. I want you to understand that when you get into this land, there is a new condition. And unless that condition is kept, you will lose what you're going to be given. And the key word of Deuteronomy, if you've read it through, and if you've underlined it, you'll know it comes, I guess, maybe at least a hundred times, is an unmentionable four-letter word. Obey. Obey. When God says move, move. And when God speaks, obey. And that's the whole of Deuteronomy in a nutshell. And I want you to get the picture of an old man, 120 years old. He has less than one month to live and he doesn't even need spectacles which is just as well because there weren't any opticians in those days and his eyesight was not dim thank God for that because he wrote down what he had to say and this old man who had less than a month to live at the age of 120 
was able to get up and say, this is what you must know before you enter in. Now, why did he have to say that? Why did we have to have the book of Deuteronomy? And it occurs to me again that it's only when God goes wrong, that when things go wrong, when the people of God go wrong, that he speaks. And in fact, it's not only true of Deuteronomy, it's true of every part of this book, that if people hadn't gone wrong, God wouldn't have spoken. Most of the epistles of Paul were written because churches were getting into trouble. Is that not right? We'd never have had the teaching we have, which we so much need, about vital things like the Lord's Supper and tongues, unless the church at Corinth had gone overboard on tongues and were getting drunk at the Lord's table. And we get all these words from God because things have gone wrong with the people of God. And then it dawned on me that if Adam and Eve had gone on living happily in fellowship with God, not a word of this book would have been written. Which shows how God is able to bring good out of evil. And how he can make all things work together for good. And how he causes even the wrath of man to praise him. And how he can take our mistakes and mold them into his plan for us. And so the book of Deuteronomy is God's word to a people who are about to enter into something beyond their wildest imaginations. And it is a plea for a renewal of commitment to the covenant that he has made with us. Such a commitment as will enable his people to keep what he's going to give them. And it is a matter of life and death and he will finish this sermon which is ten times longer than any you've had from me and he finished them with it by saying I'm setting before you life and death choose are you going to go in and find life or are you going to disobey when I say move move now he had already by this time given them one or two victories King Sihon and King Og were defeated. And the Lord has given us some victories. They are minor victories in comparison with what he's going to do. They were samples of what he could do, that's all. Now why did Moses have to run through all this again? Why, for example, did he have to include the Ten Commandments all over again? I just read this week that if God approved of our permissive age, he'd have given us the Ten Suggestions in te instead of the Ten Commandments. But he didn't give us Ten Suggestions, he gave us Ten Commandments. Why did he have to say it twice? I'll tell you why. Because of the 600,000 men he brought out of Egypt, when Moses preached the sermon we call Deuteronomy, there were only two faces in the congregation he recognized. Joshua and Caleb. And every other man over 20 he'd brought out of Egypt was lying in some grave in the middle of the barren wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. And a whole generation had missed what God had. A whole generation. And God was starting with a new generation. I praise God that our wilderness wanderings have not been long. But a new generation is going to go in. It won't be a new generation of physical age as it was then. God simply set an age limit and every man over 20 was to be denied entrance into the promised land because of the disobedience of which I must speak to you next Sunday morning. But God is not going to deal with us like that. He doesn't deal any longer on physical basis. He doesn't say you belong to the people of God because your mum and dad do. You would in the Old Testament, but not now. You belong to the people of God on a spiritual basis because you've been born again, not because you've been born. And in the same sense, the generation of this people here in our fellowship in Guildford who are not going to go in are the generation who are old in spirit and who belong to a bygone age. But the generation that is going to go in is going to be the young generation. And there are people here in their 70s and 80s who belong to the young generation. 
and they are as young in heart as the newest teenager who's been converted. And it's the young who are going to go in. And so God has to say it all over again. And Moses has to go through the Ten Commandments all over again. And he's got to spell out the implications for every department of their life all over again. But I notice that when I read Deuteronomy, it's not just a repeat of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. Very carefully, Moses is now looking back and from 40 years' perspective, he can see things that he said 40 years previously in quite a different light. And he can put it in a different way. And he sees what he said quite a different way. Now in the early chapters of Deuteronomy, Moses said, says, I'm going to take you back through our recent history and I'm going to show you what I did and what I told you to do and I want you to see it in a new light and I want you to grasp what I told your fathers and I want the young generation to see how the older generation were led. And from Deuteronomy 1, which I shared much more briefly than this with the elders when we had our weekend away, I want to tell you this, and I hope you find it reassuring. You may have been bewildered by the last two years, and so was I. But I tell you now, we've been right on course. Right on course. And it's because the people of God, if they're going to enter in, need a number of things. And God has been giving them to us one by one. And we've wondered what on earth was happening and, and why. And now we see. I'm only going to speak about two things this morning. They all begin with the letter O, so the Lord hasn't cured me of alliteration. <laughs> but they all begin with the letter O. The biggest I've already mentioned, that's the easiest one. It's written like a scarlet thread runs through every rope used in Her Majesty's Navy. There is a thread running through the whole of Deuteronomy. Obey, 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 ob obey, obey. But the first two things that I must speak to you about are not concerning obedience, only indirectly. And here's the first. If the people of God are to enter into God's promises and his blessings, the first thing they've got to have is a clear objective. You cannot go where God is going unless you've got a clear objective, unless you know where he's going, unless you know what he's going to do. That's the secret of success in the Christian life. Find out what God's doing and catch up with him. That's why Philip Greenslade's word to us the other Sunday evening was just smack on target. Whatever I see the Father doing, that's what I'm going to do, said Jesus. And we need the clear objective. And here it is, in one word, go, go. Go and take these mountains, this plain, these valleys. Take all this. And the word go, 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 I've underlined it in my Bible here. It keeps coming. Go to the hill country of the Amorites. Go to the land of Canaan. Go and occupy it. And if you draw that objective on a map, it is overwhelming. It is huge. A group of people that could live on just a few acres are being told, go and possess this. And you need a map to see what he's telling them. He's giving them an objective that is way beyond their reach. And I tell you that any objective that was, is within your reach is not of God. If it's something you could reach in the flesh, it's not of God. God is the God of the impossible and is the God who sets an impossible objective and says, go and occupy. And he drew the boundary Look, it took them 300 years to do what he told them, but God is going to achieve his objective. Praise God, he's not going to take 300 years with us. He really isn't. Now look at the territory they were to occupy. From the river Euphrates to the Mediterranean, from the hills of Lebanon right down to the Negev, it's a huge area. Israel today still hasn't got it. 
There was only one time when they came within reach of their objective. And I say this in a hushed voice. Because God has said this. They did this under David. And they got their objective. Well then what is ours? What is our objective? I'll tell you. When I turn from the Old Testament to the New Testament, I find the same God saying, go. And occupy what? the uttermost parts of the earth. Now that's an even bigger objective. It is huge. And God has set his people an impossible objective. I want you to make disciples of all the nations. Now I just praise God that God is the kind of God who when he sets the impossible objective breaks it down small enough for you to begin to grasp by faith. And so he said, go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Isn't it like the Lord to say, go? The Lord is a, a Lord who says, come, and as soon as you've come, he says, go. Have you noticed that? Come to me, and then go. Come and find rest. Come and learn of me. Come and take my yoke upon you. Come. And when you've come, he says, go. And he said to the disciples, I want you to be with me to share with me, to live with me, to learn from me, and then I want you to go for me, that I may send you. He wanted them to be disciples to come and apostles to go. So let me break down this world territory, which is not for Milmead. That territorial objective is for the church of Jesus Christ throughout the world. That's our objective. And as long as there is a tribe and a people who are not getting the gospel, our objective is not fulfilled. And you know that the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ awaits the fulfilling of that objective. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Then shall the end come. That's the objective. And that is why every church must not only be concerned with the immediate objective that God has given the church, they must also all the time be thinking of the whole objective. Even if their tribe is only going to have part of it, we've got to have our missionary thinking that tells us about the whole thing. And there's a missionary weekend coming up in October to keep us aware of the total objective. But that is too big an objective for this people. Let me now narrow it down a little. Do you know that God is going to do something new in England? Something quite fresh? He is going to have mercy on the, this land of ours. And I tell you now in his name. And the church which has been shrinking for the lifetime of everyone listening to my voice now is not going to go on shrinking. And England is going to know it. I can hardly believe that. Can you? Let the Lord stretch your faith. That is not the target for this people. But it's a target that we're going to have to bear in mind as we pursue ours. Let me narrow it down further. Guildford. God is going to do something in this town which will cause the ears of them that hear it to tingle. And he's going to do it in his way and for his glory so that no man will get the glory. But he's going to do something in this town of ours that it's never seen before. Nor will it be sudden or immediate. We're just at the beginning of what he's going to do. And it's going to include other churches too. And we must recognize and realize that. And he's going to share what he's given to us with other churches in this town. And we're going to find new allies in the battle against the forces of darkness. 
Don't start asking about problems. I know of a church that has banned the use of the word problem in all discussions. And they have insisted that every member, whenever they're going to say problem, uses the word opportunity. Which brings me to the second thing that the people of God needed here, which God told them through Moses that he had already given them. It's this, an organization that can cope with growth. The objective and the organization. Now some people think God isn't interested in an organization. Some people think that you shouldn't try and organize. Well, you shouldn't in the flesh. But God is interested in organization, provided it's organization related to the objective. And we now move to something Moses said. Moses said, look, this people has come, become too big for me to manage. I can't do it. I'm frustrated. The burden is too heavy. Now, what would your reaction be to that? I'll tell you mine. In January, I said, Lord, couldn't you just send me to a little church of 80 or 100 members where I can manage just a nice little ordinary Baptist church somewhere, please? <laughs> and that's the reaction of the flesh. Do you know what Moses' reaction to having too many to look after was? Lord, may they increase a thousandfold. That's his reaction. And some of you have been having this reaction too. Lord, give me a small church. Let me wander off to a little church where I can get to know everybody. And God is going to have to deal with you until you get to where Moses said, Lord, this is the kind of problem I want. Because it's an opportunity. I tell you, if, if the children of Israel were going to occupy all the land that God told them, they needed to multiply a thousandfold. And I want to tell you that God is interested not in addition, but in multiplication. And you find this again and again. Mind you, even his additions are pretty spectacular. There was a very nice little prayer meeting of 120, and God decided to add 3,000 to them. <laughs> now, if you don't like big numbers, you wouldn't have liked the church on the day of Pentecost, and you'd have got at it even then. God is the God of multiplication. And when he made man, he said, go into the earth and multiply, multiply. I want a big family, and it's what God wants that matters. We say, Lord, can't I just have a little small family? No, I want a big family, because I'm a big God, and I've got an awful lot of love, and I want to share it with so many. I didn't just give you my love for you, so you can be a nice little cozy family circle with me. I gave you my love so that other people might know my love. I want everybody to know it want the whole of Guildford to be in my family. And so Moses' reaction was not one of frustration, though he was frustrated. It was not one of, oh Lord, just let me have a little fellowship again. He said, no Lord, you've made your people as numerous as the stars in the sky, but multiply them a thousandfold. Lord, give me more and more and more. And we'll go and occupy that land. But then he came back to the heart of the problem but I can't do it alone. And God just very gently through his father-in-law said, I never wanted you to do it alone. Isn't that lovely? I will tell you something now that I believe to be true of the churches in this land. Every church in this land is as big or as small as the minister can make it. That's all. And churches think, you know, how can we persuade that superstar to come and minister in this little church? That's how the thinking goes. And the church is as big as the man's gifts and personality, or as small as. And that's why, up to a certain point, you can develop an audience for one man, and there'll come a point when it levels off and stagnates and the growth stops because it's not God's pattern. The one-man church is a thing of the past. And we've got to leave it behind. I can't do it alone. You know, a friend of mine in the Church of Scotland, he preached one Sunday morning on God's pattern of ministry for the church. 
and he tried to share with them the concept of ministry as not something in the pulpits, but something in the pew, of members ministering to each other and looking after each other and pastoring each other. And in the evening, when he came for the evening service, he met with the elders in the vestry, and they told him, Mr. So-and-so, we've been having a meeting this afternoon, without your knowledge, we've had a secret meeting, and we, we really discussed your sermon of this morning, because that hit us really hard. And they said, we've been discussing what we can do about it. And he said, we've had a very careful look at the finances, and we think we can afford to call you an assistant. my friend's heart nearly broke. They'd missed the message altogether. It's not a pastor plus assistants who are going to make the church grow. It's us as the people of God. Every member learning to be a minister in some way. And we're done with the days when passenger after passenger is going to be added to our membership row because they think in a big cause somebody's going to look after them. We want crew, not passengers. We want members who realize that even if they need help, and all of us do, that that help is available, but it's going to help them to be ministers, not members. It's going to fit them into the body of Christ. And so Moses saw that the key to the future was to abdicate his position and delegate and have a whole organization, and it sounds terribly complex. I, I couldn't even work out how many people he was going to replace himself with, but it's a colossal number. And he, he was going to have a man to look after a thousand, a man to look after a hundred, and a man to look after fifty, and a man to look after ten. And, and he was going to say, I'm not going to find them for you. I'm not going to go looking. You look for them among yourselves. Look for someone who's capable of looking after ten people and, and put him in charge. And as he grows in grace and gift... Give him 50. And then give him 100. That's God's pattern for the church. And I can hear the children of Israel grumbling already. I can hear somebody saying, Oh, I like the day when Reverend Moses called on me once a month. <laughs> you know? Have you heard that? And I don't want to take my problems to this man of 10. <laughs> I want the boss. <laughs> But Moses realized that if the people were to grow, the ministry was to be shared, and he said, only let through to me the things that you can't handle. But you do it. You find those men. I'll set them apart. I'll give them the authority. But you find them. The potential is there, and you find it. And he realized, quite frankly, that one of the biggest problems was disputes that arise within God's people. Oh, the Bible is so honest. It doesn't expect the people of God to be perfect. It calls them saints, but it knows perfectly well that that's a prophetic term that God is ready to apply to us now because he knows what he's going to make us. Sorry, I'm going to dare to mention somebody in the congregation because they were just such encouragement to me this morning. I came with great apprehension. I tell you honestly, I felt I was, I was preaching my first sermon all over again. And I was just so encouraged. As a brother here has come all the way from Australia, and he said, do you remember me? And I had to say, no, my memory's gone to bits of it recently. And I couldn't remember him. Brother, where are you? You're there. You don't mind standing up, do you? <laughs> tell them what you just told me as you came in. Mr. Snow spoke without a microphone and his voice was not recorded. He said that while he was in hospital in Buckinghamshire, he had been visited by Mr. Pawson, whom he didn't then know. After his discharge, he had emigrated to Australia. As a direct result of Mr. Pawson's visit, he had found that the greatest thing in life was to know the Lord, and he was now in happy fellowship with the Baptist Church in Australia. Coming into Milmead, he had told David of the outcome of his hospital visit and of the great debt of gratitude and Christian love he felt towards him. Thank you. God bless you, brother. That's way back from Chalfon St. Peter. 
<laughs> We've never met since then. <laughs> no. And the Lord gave me that little encouragement. But God's people are not perfect. And one thing you didn't tell them that you said to me, and I'm going to tell them. His name is Snow. <laughs> and he said, but he's not as white as snow yet. But I said, oh, but God's going to make you that way. Think whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. And God knows we're not perfect. And God knows that disputes will arise among his people. And he wants wise and understanding and experienced men among us who can handle disputes and who can say to people in the name of God, you're at fault or even the other person may be at fault but you're holding resentment and who can do it without fear of men with only the fear of God before whom we stand who is a just and a fair God and who will deal fairly with men knowing that they will answer to God for it. That's the kind of people we're going to need. Because the devil will not destroy us from outside, I tell you that. We can stand anything from the outside, but not disputes on the inside. And Moses knew that if we were going to go in, if they were going to go in and take the territory that God had promised them, that every dispute must be dealt with straight away by wise, understanding and experienced men. Will you look for those men, please? They are there in our midst. They're going to need supporting. And they will need instructing. And Moses told them how to go about their job, but he didn't do the job for them. Do you see the pattern? Frustration, imagination, increase them a thousandfold, delegation, look for people among yourselves to care for you. And specialization, bring the difficult cases to me. And I say on behalf of the staff that you have, Mary, Philip, and myself, we are totally united in heart, mind, and will, and totally committed to each other. And when you're in difficulties, we're here. That's how it's going to be. And verse 19 says, We did what the Lord our God commanded us. And I realize the trauma that there has been and there is going to be. And I tell you, there are traumas ahead. There are battles ahead. I will say more about this next week. But he's just asking for this one thing. He's given us our objective He's shown us the pattern of organization and we are feeling our way into it. He just asks now that we do what our Lord has commanded us. Amen. I feel we should just stand and sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. As we come together, tune.